We are sitting in a house that is located, as we all know, in the city called Toronto. Uh, this city sits on land that is uh, the indigenous um, lands for a range of communities, which include the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, and Wendat peoples. Um, again, if you live in this city, you know how diverse it is. As, you, as I sit here looking out at you, I can't tell where everyone hails from, so a lot of times we don't know um, whether people are Métis, Inuit, or hailing from other indigenous uh, lands that happen to make their home in this city. Um, it would also be important, given what BAND is, uh, the gallery's acronym stands for Black Artists Networks and Dialogue. So as black people who are currently situated in the Americas, there are some of us who are here uh, based on choice of migration. There are tons of indigenous Africans that call Toronto home. Um, from a range of parts of the continent, and there are those of us who are descendants from the transatlantic slave trade and our history is connected to forced migration. So be it choice or force, uh, for us it's important, given our uh, shared histories and knowledge of indig indigeneity, that we are allies and co-conspirators in the fight for human rights and social justice for these indigenous communities. So with that, I would just say, because uh, we hear this, and then it feels kind of hollow because people just say it, and it's like, what, the what? Um, I would just say that whatever you do with your time, however you can assist, we encourage you to do so, be it with where you donate your money, where you volunteer your time, um, or just however you may be able to assist in that, we encourage folks to do so. Um, we, uh, at BAND, also, uh, just want to tell you a bit about this work. Someone like Forbes' ability to have his first solo exhibition here is attached to our mandate, which is about primarily showing emerging artists. We do show established artists, but often the established are there to help from an education standpoint. The organization was started in 2010 by four black women, myself, Maxine Bailey, uh, Dr. Julie Crooks, who's at the AGO, and Karen Terrell, who also both Maxine and Karen work, one on the presenting side of film and one on the production side. Um, uh, Claudia, our gallery manager, already mentioned, and I think I sort of hinted that the work is for sale. I'll be more clear. <laughs> Buy some art, support local artists, um, especially talented ones uh, like our Forbes, because it won't be accessible for long, and one of the things we try to do is make the work accessible with, with its price points. So we do have payment plans and such, so please feel free to inquire, because uh, I remember when I learned that all of those prices that I saw at big dealer galleries that people didn't just pay 10 grand. They saw you had to pay for it all at once. And then when I learned payment plans, it changed my life. So uh, it's a good thing to let folks know. Forbes sang, how are you? You didn't know that? <laughs> you didn't know we let people pay in installments? Who are you right now? <laughs> So um, I'm going to shift to to you and this conversation that we're about to have uh, and begin by asking you to tell the people. Uh, some of them kind of know you, but some of them may not. And I feel like even the ones who know you might learn something new today about how you came to your art practice. We've had conversations with people who say they always knew they were artists. Um, uh, so maybe how and when, and then why photography, because we know your practice started with photo-based work. Um, and then we'll shift to, because we're sitting in a room full of paintings, we'll shift to that after, but maybe just origins of Forb the Artist. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I born in Oakville and raised there for most of my life, and then came to Toronto. Uh, both of my parents were artists, um, and I kind of always had that like growing up, and so a lot of like in saying that I I make art, but my my brother doesn't, and you know he can if he wants. I don't know, but we'll see. <laughs> but um, can he? No, really. <laughs> He's like, no, it all went there. <laughs> but I I did feel very like um, you know very very blessed that I had artists as parents in my life, and even though they don't practice it as much as I'd even like them to. Um, that it was something that was always in my life. And um, so was that about seeing them make at home or visiting galleries? Like, was it the whole soup? It's kind of everything. And just seeing, like, art was 
it was, I don't want to say it was pushed on me, um, but it was always in my life. And I, art, like my family, I find there's a bunch of artists in different ways. And um, yeah, I just thought that it was kind of my path to go there and do that kind of thing. Um, I didn't know what, and I still don't really know what it's going to be and how it's going to be um, or what I make. And it all pretty much started when I, I was taking a lot of photos on my phone um, in high school. And then I got a camera for Christmas one year. And then I started posting a bunch. And then um, it was time to apply for schools. And I didn't really care about anything else other than taking photos of pretty buildings, pretty people. That's pretty much all I cared about. And I didn't really see a future in that and needed some guidance. Uh, so art school was that, and I went to OCAD. I got in with editing on Visco, uh, which I think is kind of crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was just like kind of using whatever I had on hand and, and kind of just, that's kind of how I make art now. Um, and there's a lot of more things that are accessible to me now than they were back then. Um, not to say I had like a rough upbringing at all. <laughs> I had a very good upbringing. Yeah, when I hear Oakville, <laughs> yeah, Oakville is tough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, very great upbringing. Very glad for the parents I have. Um, but yeah, it. That's kind of how it started. I I started taking photos, and then I remember. Um, at OCAD in my first year, I was just taking photos like how I was in high school, taking photos of things that I thought were pretty or things that I thought were interesting, but nothing really meaningful, at least to myself. Um, and yeah, it, w it was fine in that sense. And I was happy making that stuff, but I was kind of sick of taking photos of my friends, like covering their faces and doing all that weird stuff we did. and. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at a certain point, I, I met a prof in my second year, uh, Min Suk Lee, and she's like... Artist, activist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, she's great. She had a documentary called uh, Migrant Workers. Yeah. And um, talking to her about background and race and everything like that, I took her class and and she was like, you need to figure out where you came from. And I was like, OK. <laughs> and, just like, and she said that and saying that. And, and that made me think, OK, cool. I, what does this mean for me? What, what, what do I have to do? Why, why do I need to do this? And so. And it is a question like that, because I mean, I, I understand the way you either recall or the way she might have phrased it. But I think you know where you came from. You know your parents, yeah. right? You, the, your photos show an understanding of the extension of immediate and extended family. You mm -hmm. see that in the work. So was it more about how that question would impact the work you created? It's exactly, yeah. So she, uh, to rephrase what she said, she mm -hmm. said, in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you came from. And that stuck with me, and I still think about that today. And, and I'm trying to think of, of that in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I thought, OK, to figure out where I'm going, I'll just look at family, you know? And uh, started looking at archive images and started thinking about race and being biracial and white passing, all this stuff um, that I'm still learning about today and still trying to figure out. And I don't know if I ever will, but I think if I did, I wouldn't be making art, you know? And I think that's kind of what this is, is just a exploration of figuring out who I am. <laughs> it's funny that, you know, people can relate to that. Um, and yeah, let's jump forward a bit, because uh, yeah. um, that idea of this body of work resonating with so many people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we talked about that, about some of the uh, wave of emotional reactions that you saw even at the opening mm -hmm. and people who were like cornering you. I remember one young, young woman saying to me, I didn't know I needed this show, but I needed this show. She's also white presenting and told a story about coming. She's here from Trinidad going to school and being in a line earlier that day where someone was hearing her Trinidadian accent and couldn't register when her face flipped and she looked the way she did. And then they proceeded to ask her if white people were in Trinidad 
won't go down there because <laughs> I don't understand. Like, I think all of us are everywhere now, and definitely the Caribbean is this mix of everyone. Uh, so to have someone not get that was a bit odd. But I mean, maybe talk a bit about how uh, this work has moved from the personal to a public space and what that means. Even as you examine these things, it, has it shifted the way you think about art as a way of examining identity? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that, like I've always wanted to make bigger work and I think I'm still working with family and stuff, but I remember showing you the other day, like thinking about famous black people that can be seen as whitewashed because that's kind of what happens in, in our media today. And I was thinking like, how can this go beyond family? Because I know my family might be sick of this and just like, you know, seeing themselves presented all the time. And I, it could be tough, but thank you guys for <laughs> letting me do this. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm starting to try and think about other things that can expand outside of family and maybe make it to a, a bigger population of people that could also resonate with that or go, oh yeah, that's me in there. Or that's the other thing I want to try and paint people that are ambiguous. And So let's then move to, uh, and maybe you can quickly reference the archive with family. Like was that a process of you just pulled photos and people let you pull them? Or did you have to get approval? Like did family have to be okay, you're okay to use that? No, you can't touch that one type of thing for the pieces that are in the back. So maybe talk a bit about that as we pivot from clearly uh, we always say to artists that are here that we present them as artists and then present the medium the work is presented in. Mm -hmm. Because for us, saying someone's a photographer is forcing them to be one thing. And for us, an artist can dance across different mediums, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that you began in photo-based work. That's what yeah. uh, your studies, that's what you went to school for. And it's a, place you were playing in with work initially, but you've now moved into painting. So maybe talk just about maybe that transition and the comfort with that. Yeah. Um, to, to go off the archive photos, a lot of that started in my fourth year um, and third, fourth year at OCAD. And it was a time where I was sick of taking photos. Um, not even sick of it, but I felt like it dove too deep into my family and I think it was kind of getting too touchy. Um, so I started not taking the photos and started using photos that already existed um, in order to make new work. And I thought the idea of inverting my own skin, which I came across randomly uh, just playing with photographs um, that I took and photos that were uh, archived, like sitting in my mom's basement, um, yeah, I started flipping those into, into negatives and seeing how it changed my skin and my brother's skin and leaving the positive around that there. Mm -hmm. uh, because like, then again, my, my childhood was positive. It wasn't negative, it wasn't anything like that. Um, but the, the like, idea of being mixed could be negative and it could be seen as negative. And people, I think there are things that come with that that even you said the Trinidadian lady, um, there's things that I see on a day-to-day -day basis that people wouldn't say if they saw, like, if I were black. If you're you know? visibly black. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's, it's, it, well, it's the, I think I told you a story about a, there's a, a politician, uh, well-known, uh, retired uh, city councilor, Bev Salmon, who told stories about she was white presenting I'm, go I'm going between white presenting and white passing because I've been hearing that word presenting more and I prefer it to passing because I feel like passing is more of a choice whereas presenting is not something you control. And we, uh, you guys have probably seen the movies that have been made recently about people uh, feeling the need to be forced to live this other double life to, for survival at particular times in history, especially a lot of them coming out of the US. So I, I prefer, and, and we had talked about this, that the statement I wrote said passing, and then in retrospect, I was like, it should say presenting, but it had already gone to the printers. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia wouldn't let me pull it back. I blame it on Claudia. Um, 
but that idea of the negative I find interesting because yeah. I didn't and I don't know we, if we'll let you because I know you're all dying to jump in we'll let you jump in um, for me the gray was about you just playing on this idea of the notion of black and white it wasn't I didn't even see it as a negative or positive inversion I know technically that's what was happening with uh, your use of your skills as a photographer but it was more of this idea of the grayscale yeah. um, as this idea of how do you choose a, you not choosing a side but yeah. choosing almost to walk through the world and with an understanding that race is a social construct and the way the society is throwing things at you you're trying to balance what yeah. those two things mean whether they're visibly present as you would say it isn't for you, but it might be visibly present for your brother or for other people who are uh, of mixed heritage. Yeah, it's not one or the other, but both. Yeah. And that's, so it started with the photo and then it turned into the painting. And that's where the great gray people version. come from. And yeah, and so I thought at the, at the height of COVID, it was my fourth year um, at OCAD and I couldn't, I'd, felt like I couldn't take photos. Um, and so that's when I started painting. Um, and I got a studio in the beaches with a few of my friends and I had a big room and I was able to, and it wasn't a place that we lived, even though I did live there some nights. And yeah, it was just, it was a spot for us to create. And we were just three um, kids going to OCAD that, and we're still kids, but kids going to OCAD that we wanted to like have freedom and do what we want. And that was a space for us to do it. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't photograph the things that I wanted to talk about. And I felt like the only way I could do it is paint the photos I want to talk about. And that's kind of how these come about and how that started. Tell me about, uh, because we talked about references for um, your influence and I thought it was interesting that you went from uh, someone like a Lorna Sims or um, other heavyweights, I'll let you name, mm -hmm. to someone local like Nathan Carson. Yeah. So maybe talk a bit about Nathan's uh, influence in your choice to paint, but his mm -hmm. encouragement to just say to you, like, just play. Like yeah. the, 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 the freedom for an artist to just make stuff and see where it goes mm. and how important that was for you in that transition. Yeah, I, uh, I had a professor named April Hickox and she lives on the island and she's really, she had Nathan as a student, I, I'm pretty sure, and she's really good friends with Nathan. And she was my prof in fourth year during COVID and it was all online and she said, Forbes, you need to reach out to Nathan and talk to him. And I procrastinated forever doing that. I waited to like the, my, my second semester to do that. And I reached out and he's a nice person. You know, I wasn't like, I was scared because you see his name places and you think like this is a, an artist that's like making it and you, you just don't know what to do. So I'll just jump in before you go ahead to give context. So Nathan by this point would have had a show, solo show at the uh, par park Power Plant Art Gallery, Contemporary Art Gallery, mm -hmm. uh, and was, you may not have known this, but there was like stories about people, heavyweight collectors going to see him to buy work. He was not saying yes to sales because if he didn't feel like it was a good vibe, he just would say no. Like, it was just, he lives in this rarefied, beautiful space as like the most pure artist, which is amazing. But uh, knowing that and then getting the intro mm -hmm. must have made you be like, this guy's showing the power plant. Now, yeah. there's a whole bunch of artists in Toronto who want to get into that place. I was like, how am I just messaging him? <laughs> how am I just you know, really yeah. hanging out with Nathan? And so, yeah, so I, I emailed him and he emailed me back and he said, let's have a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and we scheduled it. And I remember telling my dad that, like, oh, I'm going to go to the studio. I'm going to have this Zoom meeting with him at, like, 8 p.m. It's going to be good. You just get ready. I was on at like 7.40, just waiting. <laughs> I was like, just ready. And uh, hop on, and he didn't show up. And I was crushed. I was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. 
And then he messaged me the next day. He's like, sorry, I completely forgot I was, like, out partying. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, whatever. Now the, I'm gonna no, I know. Someone was <laughs> and I was like, all right, sick. Like, we can reschedule. I was, like, so, like, thrown off. I was like, fine, we'll reschedule, whatever. Like, it's, I was, like, kind yeah, of angry. Me, yeah. Whatever. I was like, I had important things to do. Too. No. <laughs> No, uh, but so we rescheduled and we did talk and we talked each other's ears off like for like three hours just talking about anything. Now we FaceTime, he talks to me about like partners he's seeing, I talk to him about people I'm seeing, like everything and it's a good relationship and he helps me so much with, like I use him as my artist therapist, you know, and he probably does the same with me. He says, I learn as much as you learn from me as I do, like vice versa. Yeah, he checks on you, he messages me. Yeah. That's our boy. <laughs> <laughs> that opening. <laughs> so <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah. And like, we have a funny relationship and I, I'm very grateful for him because he's gotten me to where I am now. Um, he introduced me to you and that's how this came about. And yeah, it's, it's so grateful for that. Yeah, and he didn't just introduce me. It was kind of like, you have to go see him. People introduce you because stuff comes our, where, our way. People send things online or they'll send an email or sometimes they'll just come by with someone. But he was like, Karen, have you followed up with Forbes? What, what are you doing? <laughs> get, in the, get on this, Karen. I was like, okay, Nathan, <laughs> calm down already. So by the time we booked, the, and again, COVID delays, delayed a bunch of things. But by the time I think we were even comfortable with coming to see work in person because we did virtual first and then followed up with the in-person. Um, yeah, it was uh, clear that he was correct and you were growing and, and creating work, but even this early work was super interesting. Yeah. Um, do you want to turn to specific things? Do we have questions, comments about this at this stage, family? Are y'all still comfortable? All your business out on the street here? I want to hear about the parents who were making art. Photography, painting, what medium? Just trying to get through old cards. Whatever they threw at you. Yeah. Mom? Um, I, I like to paint. Water paint? Blood, yeah. Watercolor? Okay. There you go. Yeah. Mixed media and watercolor. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, but and, yeah. and you're sure there's no town uh, now? Uh, no. Mac and cheese? <laughs> <laughs> you're a chef. That's what it is. You're a chef. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, any other questions? Um, comments? Uh, well, I'll cut you off if it's a soliloquy. I'll be unforgiving, but otherwise, I will let you have a comment or question. Uh, before we jump into the specific works, are we good? What do you want to start with? Should we talk about the, I feel like we sort of already talked about the photo-based work yeah. enough, uh, but I don't know if you want to pick on a specific piece. I, I did write in the statement that you inverted your face. I didn't refer to the fact that you did your brother. And I feel like, were there times where it was more than you and your brother? No, it's always, it always just been brother. my brother and I. Okay. Yeah. Because there are times I'm like, who is that? I'm not sure. The hair is curlier. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of like, at what stage is this little person now? And I couldn't always tell. Um, yeah. uh, maybe you can just, for the photo based piece, talk about the, I want to say ticker tape, but that's not the right word. What is that? The border? The strip, yeah. Yeah, the strip. Uh, yeah, that, that collage. That came about from a different piece, and that we decided to do, do that for this space. Um, but yeah, that was just, just me like trying to frame my life, um, and the people that surrounded it. And there was a completely different piece and that went around as a, as a big frame. And I showed that at OCAD. Um, but that, in that frame in, was a photo of my back and just like, <laughs> oh. uh, I like to refer it and I think other people refer to it as like a tortilla back. <laughs> It's like mm, little what? stuff. <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> Is that a visual we needed? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, but it's out there. But um, yeah, it's that. So I had my back framed in there. It was just my skin tone, mm -hmm. um, and 
it was just that my skin tone is a combination of all these people and that's how I'm framed in it and yeah and it didn't show a face of mine uh, unless it was a childhood photo but yeah I thought it was just interesting to that exactly what Minsuk said is like trying to find out where you come from um, but yeah okay so <laughs> painting yeah where should we go? Should we go to? Well, I I, I don't think everyone was told that there's uh, RBC's acquired the promotional image, which is the barber shop. Uh, they confirmed that this week, which is big stuff. You got to mm -hmm. tell our Nathan that. Yeah. Uh, um, which I'm very excited about. Did you want to start with the earlier stuff? Uh, and then you tell move me. Towards. Yeah. You want to start early yeah. and work your way forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if everyone got a chance to walk around, but the first piece I pretty much created as a painting when I was starting to think of this idea was the portrait of my grandma's. Um, and that kind of framed how I want to, or I wanted to make art and, and how I wanted to paint. Everyone asks about the eyes and it's just because I don't like painting eyes. I don't know how to do it. It doesn't make sense. I hate it. <laughs> and so, I came up with this idea of just making them white slots and people look at it as either they ask me if it's about my Asian background or they ask me if it's a mask or something and I just say it's because I can't paint eyes. But at the, <laughs> at the same time, it's also just because like now it's become this thing and now I'm painting like pinhole eyes. Um, instead of these kind of narrow looking things. And yeah, they, it's just become this thing now that I like to do uh, with a lot of the work. And um, yeah, I just to going back saying that people can relate to the work mm -hmm. and I like that people can kind of fill their own eyes into this person. And yeah, I find kinda, that literally what you just said, that yeah. interesting element of how Often with paintings, they say, or with photography, is that the gaze of the figure is such a, it either pulls you in or mm -hmm. or disarms you, or it's, it's usually the thing that draws people to examine the work deeper. So to some extent, in taking the direct gaze away, um, it really, like the, and we'll, we'll uh, because there's a lot of people who are in love with the guy with the, with the sheep. Uh, with the baby, uh, um, sheep. Sheep. Sure. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's, it's a baby goat. Like I feel like there's a bunch of things that look at that that come to mind. Yeah. But um, it it there's because it's a, that's a direct gaze, like it's looking at you, or this piece behind you with the father with the two kids, like it's a direct, and yet it's not because of the mm -hmm. the choice of uh, how the eyes are not present. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's... Sorry, just, I, I distracted. Back to grandma's. <laughs> so where are they? They're... Like now? No, what not photos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Not now, I'm just in that photo. Uh, I, or in that I painting. I don't know. I actually, I don't, maybe one of my, my mom knows. Was it from, I think you said it, it was, was from a photo? It was photo? from a photograph, and the photo pretty much looked like that. I might have changed some colors, but yeah. Yeah, that resonates a lot with people. I know when I first saw it, as I think I said to you, we made your brother find this painting uh, because I was like, what do you mean he doesn't know where it is? We must have this must be included. We're, we're not, we haven't quite forgiven you for that. You did not know where this painting was. But it looks to me like there are two elderly ladies that could be, you know, two nurses at a nurses association meeting up. Like it could be two ladies at a church basement event. They could be sitting at a performance at the school. Like there's just so many ways that these two people seemingly f with nothing in common in the way we often lop race and separation in the world, but then they're sitting there almost the same cross-legged, the, the dresses almost reflect each other, the cup of tea, the way they hold, they look like the same people. The mm. only difference is they probably had the exact same lives, but they had this different shade of skin. Yeah. It resonates. People could be there for like, they see their grandmothers in that yeah. photo. Yeah, and we had that, that piece. those people from TIFF. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that I don't know where that photo was taken. Do you remember, Mom? Yeah. Do you want to tell us? 
It was a work uh, baby shower after I had Caleb. Work baby shower. <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. I, yeah, that's cool to me. I don't know. I, I just saw the photo, and I, that's how I did a lot of my beginning work, is I went to my mom's house in t like to say hi to her as well. <laughs> but really, but, he was just there to but, take through the archives. <laughs> that, that was a big mission for me, is just like, I need to go find some ideas in yeah. uh, these bins we have downstairs of, of photographs and just kind of paint what what we have yeah and so a lot of times i'd go and and find photos that i'd go yeah i can invert this face or i'd go and i'd find uh photos that i can paint it you know and i think it has some interesting topic and then i started kind of making up my own um which is harder so much harder <laughs> but yeah i so it started there and then it and that's when i was painting people without inverting their skin um, and it kind of moved on to the the Klansman one. Um, Talk about the Klansman one. Was yeah. that? I, I think you had said it was somewhat a political commentary because I find that fascinating because so much of the rest of it is clearly, as you said, you're deep in the family commentary soup. You're pulling images that are related to your yeah. personal uh, uh, life, live narrative in some way. But this piece is clearly. You don't have Klansmen in the family. No, no. no. Uh, I didn't think so. <laughs> Not <laughs> that I know. Like, no. <laughs> 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 and you, uh, there aren't priests in the family. Are there? Mm, nuns? No, no, there are. There we are? are we ministers. My grandfather was a minister. Oh yes, you yeah. did say that. Um, so, so the religious narrative, because we did talk about yeah. that. Uh, the pre, the artists that showed before. Uh, um, uh, the conversation around religion and identity and specifically her Christian faith and how that's impacting the creation of her work. Mm -hmm. We had a brief conversation about what, especially because that often feels like the idea of being religious in some way and art has become this very separate dialogue, which is weird when you think historically about going to Europe and other places in the world and seeing all these great artworks that were painted by people literally directly commenting on deities and uh, their religious uh, position or ideas. So it's just weird that it seems that you're not, people are not necessarily giving license to do that now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so should we talk about what, was there an incident? Because we know the last couple of years with things that have been going on, there's been a whole bunch of incidents. So yeah. was there a particular incident in the media that led to that or were you just like, hmm? I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint the Last Supper. Uh, <laughs> I, it was a, it was an angry time in my painting phase, and we, when you came to do the studio visit, um, I remember showing you some of the work, and then showing you this work as well, and you being like, "This doesn't match at all. <laughs> like, this is so <laughs> different. different. Yeah, some is paint everywhere, and just like mad and like." like red hands. We on chose it. to start with the stuff that was more <laughs> warm and fuzzy. <laughs> and so yeah, I that was one that came out of it that wasn't so angry, but it did have that connotation around it. Um, and it was all because of uh, seeing Sean Sean King. Mm -hmm. Um and I followed him like like hard on Instagram and just seeing his posts and it was at a time when he was posting about uh, Jesus being black and I thought I was like okay let's dive into this and it was at a time when you looked up Jesus on like Safari or Google and a photo of Sean King would pop up and I was like this is nuts like this is crazy so I, I started kind of diving into that and then diving into my own religion and my faith and I'm still confused on what, you know, we were talking about this is like, what do we believe? What, what, there's something out there maybe, I don't know. There's so many things to think. But yeah, um, yeah it's just, it kind of came from that. And I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna remove Jesus because apparently Jesus is Sean King and like, <laughs> do all this stuff. <laughs> Don't do that to Jesus. Jesus ain't John King. Let me look at the camera and say Jesus is not John King. No. I, I know that, but I was just like trying to trying to comment. Google said so. <laughs> 
Probably not anymore. No, but I'm sure not anymore. Was, I'm pretty sure they went for the uh, yeah. people who went for Sean King and a whole bunch of oh. people <laughs> telling them to shut up. And for sure. Um, but, uh, listen, I'm glad it led to this amazing yeah. painting. There's a lot of people who, I think Dean, who's one of our volunteers, he's an actor. Um, uh, and he was like, he had come through and seen the piece we were setting up because he's also our groundsman and our barman, uh, mm -hmm. Dean. Uh, and he was like, that piece. He literally came outside and was like, the Last Supper piece. He was like, oh my, I need him to explain that to me. For me, what strikes me about that, I know if folks want to comment, is the removal of the uh, Christ-like figure Jesus. in the center, right? And so it's almost, for me, it's a direct comment here on how people, frankly, as we know, will take, I think uh, people who are Muslim or other religious um, uh, beliefs will say this, people can co-op things that are supposed to be about love and safety and faith and kindness and drag it into this whole other place. And you have to be able to see where all of that goodness has nothing to do with what people are doing. And so for me, I love that you painted that not with any uh, perception or representation of a uh, Christ-like figure, but without them, because it's literally saying how this conversation has actually removed anything to do with what um, the beliefs of most core religious principles are, which is about love, faith, kindness, being good to people, like just the things that's supposed to make you draw towards this idea of believing in something bigger than yourself for your own safety, but also for you to walk through the world, hopefully with a bit of kindness and humanity for people, right? So that's why I love that piece, because it was a, it was literally this direct commentary of what's happening here has absolutely nothing to do with what mm -hmm. true uh, faith and something bigger than yourself, whatever you call your God is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but there's another person missing. No, and yeah, that... That was supposed to be um, Mary, supposedly, and that that was the big question at the time, and I didn't really have much knowledge of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really know if. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't really know if I was like gonna paint them in there yeah. or put that there. So it was confusing because there was supposed to be 11 disciples around and then Mary was beside Jesus. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, and there's so many different articles and things about this that are confusing and you're like, I don't, no one knows who this person is. So I took them both out and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna leave it at that. You wanna say um, something else? But yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're thinking about? Is that he was missing because by the time this was, when it was painted, it was that Judas had already gone to the betrayal? Possibly. But what's in the guy's hand with the white? That's just his, like, his shirt. That's yeah. just his shirt. Yeah, I don't think there's, there's, a, the, it's, there's no actual holding of anything. I don't think it's not that literal. I do mm -hmm. look at that every once in a while and go, was he, were you about to paint something and then didn't? Yeah. You yeah. change your mind, with but you the, can't tell with us. the holding? Yeah. Honest, like, it was, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's totally okay. <laughs> totally cool. Um, Where's the yeah. next? I have a question. Oh, yes. I'm interested in, like, the lack of food on the table, mm. right? Yeah. The, the idea that, like, the painting is communion, and that communion, the eating brings people together across differences, but there's nothing on the table to unite them. Right. So it's another layer of the void of... Yeah. of That's how I see yeah. it, like the inverted. Yeah. It, yeah, the only thing is... So there's is, no food, there's no eyes, the eyes are black now. If we look at, instead of just transmit, people with white sheets, I, I look at it the other way, where it's the inverted picture that you, you painted, so there's no mm. physical thing. So mm. this is like the other side of it. So there's, yeah. 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 That's a good Lots point. of perceptions. Yeah. That's the thing I like about making work is that people see different things and yeah. then it starts a conversation. I never thought as much about the food. I focus more on the fact that any, the, the center of the figure was supposed to be. And I always, mm -hmm. I know there's arguments whether it's Mary, Christ's mother, Mary Magdalene. 
but whoever it was, it's still people that are seen as, you know, righteous, good people that were mm -hmm. at the center. And then everyone else on the side was a supporting cast. And I think a lot of people who see themselves as religious leaders would see themselves as that supporting cast. And I think what we're finding out now is a lot of them are frankly not. <laughs> and that, that idea of food as communion, so the food missing further reinforces that. Yeah. The food was more like I, I thought about you that. Don't for, food. No, it, well it wasn't even that. Like the eyes, it's like that yeah. <laughs> it was more so like it's a clansman's last supper. I don't think they should eat. You know, and that was kind of just the thought, and That's I don't know. I don't <laughs> Last man, last supper. I don't think they should eat. Yeah, and that was kind of the the big thing behind it too. Is like it is that big feast, and it's the big last supper, and you're eating the the body of Christ. And I was like, okay, well, I don't, I don't think that really makes sense to give it to them, you know, if that's what they're they're gonna eat, you know. And yeah. I did plan on painting some food on there, but after thought. I was also lazy, so I didn't want to do that. But, <laughs> I yeah. love where an artist admit those things that really <laughs> dry was it? It was like, I was just done. It was like, good long day. Yeah. Finished. So, yeah. Go out. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. Um, where should we jump to? Any more questions, comments? Or maybe, do you want to pick something? We had stuff picked, but I feel like you know all this work like the back of your hand. Do you, do you, is anyone interested in anything in particular? Or should we just go wherever the spirit moves us? Hmm. Yeah, I love that yeah. piece. Who's in the window? Who's in the window? This is the one with the basketball, the kid with the basketball. Yeah. In the middle beside the, uh, For me, it, the, the decision to lay the work in that order is partly about sizing, but also because it felt like it could have been the, him going to the barber shop, freshly cut, and then going to play ball. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but who was in the window? Forbes? It's me and my mom looking at my brother outside. Oh. Yeah. That's your brother there, not here? Yeah, I'm, I'm smaller than him, so. <laughs> <laughs> Does your brother yeah. play basketball? He did. He did? Actually, he, yeah, he just joined the league. <laughs> but yeah. Was that the house in Oakville? Yeah. Was was the what did you play get to play ball like that on the street? I feel like in Toronto that's like I would say where's the ball hockey? Where where are the children playing on the streets? So every time I see a no ball hockey sign, I'm like, what is wrong with this town? I grew up where there was a cul de sac and there was you just played on the street. That's what you did. That's what that's what we did. Our we had our own net at one point, but then neighbors had their own nets as well. We lived on like an enclosed street, so it wasn't um like so many cars all the time. The only problem would be if cars were parked and the ball would hit it if we missed. And the alarm would go Which was off. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, we played on the street a lot. And yeah, it was, it was just something that I thought, like I was also very, uh, was at a time when there was a lot of stuff going on with kids like at parks and stuff. And so my mom was very protective of me leaving the house. And I always thought my brother could do so much more. He was so much older, he could go and play. And I was like, I couldn't even leave the house to go play. So it was, yeah, so I was just looking up. <laughs> but that's kind of what that's based on, but yeah. There's a whole different vision of that right now. I yeah. thought it was two people who didn't know the kid who were just looking at watching through the fact that there's an actual connect. You literally do have all your family business and all these paintings. I didn't realize that. But I don't think I asked about that one. So there you go. Um, should we talk about the uh, sheep or the goat? I just feel like it's a goat. Can you just pretend it's a it's, goat? It's a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that one. I'm very, I feel like I'm very nos like nostalgic driven, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, started in a, a, a hair salon, this one kind of this thought and so when I was pretty young my mom would take me to the her hair salon and she would get her hair cut and I would wait uh, and just I remember one time I think it was some sort of festival it was or Santa Claus parade, Santa Claus parade. okay <laughs> festival <laughs> um, and some lady was walking around with a shopping cart handing out stuffed animals to kids and I 
went outside and my mom was still inside getting her hair done and I brought this lamb back in, the sheep. And my mom was like, where did you get, like who gave you this? Why do you have this? Random. Yeah, Random yeah. yeah. And, I, and I was like, no, this lady gave it to me from her cart. Like, I, it's mine. <laughs> so, and so that's kind of how it came about. Did um, you keep it? Because my mother would have said hell to the no, I didn't yeah, know where it came it from. <laughs> I kept it for a while and then yeah. we, we gave it away. Um, but yeah, it, it, this painting came about because of that and that's the backstory from it. Um, and that's a self-portrait basically, but Nathan uh, was telling me to submit work to um, Art With Heart. And He's like, do a painting or do something. It needs to just like do it quick and submit. And so um, I made this for that and it didn't get accepted. The other photo did, which I'm super happy about. But um, yeah, it can't, that's where it came from. I kind of wanted something to, I don't know, that's my most recent painting uh, in this series in here. Yeah, you can see the change from the the density of the piece that uh, uh, is in the barber shop or the need it's almost like you felt the need to have more stuff to fill out the canvas mm -hmm. to going to this place where you're totally okay with something that's more singular mm -hmm. and the power of that is really uh, it's it's really lovely even the choice of the backdrop with that peachy oil mm -hmm. color should we tell them about how you sent things here that so we're still so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah when we when we were doing the show, um, I didn't have everything finished. <laughs> and Karen said, okay, you need to bring the work down. And this was like a week or two before the show opening. Um, and I brought everything down and nothing was stretched. And she was like, what, what is this? And I was like, telling Karen, I was like, I've never done this. What do you, what do you want? I don't know, <laughs> no clue. Um, but she sent me off to buy stretch bars and uh, stretched everything and got it all done. And then the day before, or like, no, t uh, like three days before, I painted all the sides of the canvases, um, except a few, and, uh, and that, that's, th that's acrylic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some of the paintings have this pink on it, and I was like, okay, I have a big tube of this pink at home. I'm just gonna bring it in and clean up some of the edges, but the pink is oil. And so I did that and I didn't tell Karen. And I was like, okay, this is, this is fine. And so, <laughs> so they're installing the, that day and her hands are all pink and <laughs> But I was worried that I was gonna, so then I had to go back and make sure, did I touch oil <laughs> somewhere where it didn't belong and ruin another painting? I was like, I am going to her Forbes when he got just like, what the what have you done? But, like, yeah. a little heads up, <laughs> not <laughs> But that's the thing, I think that's like why, that's why I like making art, is it's just fun and you can just do it. you hate me, but it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> you just do it. No, no, I hate you, the hate's a very strong word. Well, not I'm hate, sorry, I don't, I don't mildly mean. annoyed. <laughs> it would be nice to go deeper in the barbershop, yeah. yes, please, share. Um, no, I don't mean that in a bad way either, it's just, ever, since I was little, we, my brother and I, we played basketball, and it was always uh, a mission to get our hair cut before a game and like get a clean lineup. That was always it, and I would, never was able to grow up my hair, and that was one thing that I always wanted to do. And I, I don't know, I don't know. But that's how it is now, but there's always been the the connotation of the barbershop in my life, and even now as an adult who can get his own haircuts, and I do, I still get a lineup, and I still get a fade, and I still get all that stuff. And that's just been in my life, and it's always been a black barbershop, and there's always been something about that that it feels like home, and it feels like a place that I'm comfortable, but at the same time not. As a white person sitting in, or as a white presenting person sitting in a barbershop, uh, a black barbershop, there's different ideas around that. And that shop, all of them in the city, they bring different people in. Um, but yeah, I made work 
about the Black Barber Shop in my first year, and that was a, pretty much a collaboration with you, because um, you printed out all the things for the, and I showed you that work, it was above the door. Um, but yeah, that that's just been in my life, and I thought that that should be interesting to paint, because I haven't really seen much about a mixed person who goes into a black barbershop, you know? I've seen stuff work about the barbershop, but I haven't seen work about like what it means to be in there. And yeah, that's where this kind of came about. Um, that one over there as well. And I have more work about that, but yeah. I mean, I, I love this piece. It's, it is uh, probably one of my favorites next to the, the grandma's because of the density of it. There's so much going on in it. So it feels very much like a black barber shop. Like you walk in, it's a bit higgledy-piggledy with the plastic flowers, the Jamaican flag, uh, or some flag of some, of some spot. But we, we had a visitor last week, a couple uh, that's in Ronti that came by, and we literally spent about an hour dissecting this painting because they were talking about the perspective because they had seen it as a promotional image and they talked about the perspective of, are you looking in and then why is the window at the back, but then the mirrors are reflecting windows that are clearly at the side where the, um, person sitting at the edge, you're seeing the reflection. Like if you get up close and you see how many, how much things are going on in this tiny painting, I mean, we can see why uh, RVC thought it was uh, the right piece to acquire, but it's really, it's, it's a really amazing piece. And I think your comment right now about who, which I, I find interesting. I feel like there's a thing, especially in barbershops right now, where, or in salons, where it feels like everybody's everywhere where more people are aware of just people choose to go to places where they understand hair texture. And so I remember being uh, in, which you don't know, my university days when I had cut off all my hair and my father wouldn't talk to me because apparently my hair is my beauty and without hair I just shouldn't be in his house. He was not a very happy man. But I was in university rebelling and I wanted to grow dreads so I chopped off all my then straightened, chemically relaxed hair and was just starting from scratch. And my brother worked at a barbershop. I remember going there and seeing like Greek, uh, Jewish, like just people with thicker or coily hair that the barber would know how to cut their hair. And even frankly, just, you know, deep scarber white people, the white boys wanted, you know what I mean when I say deep scarber, don't you, you do. Cause they went and they would get their hair cut at the barbershop too, cause they wanted a fade. So just, it's fascinating for me, for you to talk about any sense of discomfort, because it feels like a barbershop is like the ultimate safe space for diversity and difference in some ways. Uh, it was like as a kid, it, it was kind of scary. And I think my dad knew that I didn't like going. Yeah. And that's why I got a Jamaican patty after. <laughs> and that's like, that's the whole reason why. You know, Jamaican patties had to be at the yeah, opening. It was, it was <laughs> It was a reward. I was able to have a, a patty and a piece of cocoa bread with it as a reward of getting a, a fade. But it was something that was, it sounds so silly, but it was like, that was the only way I would do it, you know? Like, <laughs> so you could look forward to the yeah. treat after. Yeah. And it's right now funny for me because I'm looking over at you with the, clearly <laughs> you're still getting the haircut and you are like, your hair's grown in and you have had on, so clearly you did not go to the barbershop recently. So even now it's like, your brother was like, I've drank the Kool-Aid, I'm going to the barber. <laughs> and you were clearly like, no, you will let yeah. it grow out willy-nilly. Exactly. But yeah, it's just, that's kind of just always been in, in in my life and um, I yeah I still go now to black barber shops I won't really ever go to like a, a fancy place yeah. like that to me the black barber shops fancy and yeah this is based off of a barber shop on pape um, the one on the corner and yeah it's just that's that's pretty much what it is to me and that's that's how it is it changed the colors of it is there a reason for is, the, is there a commentary on the person who appears white in the chair with the black barber? Yeah. Is that literally That's part me. of that? Is that you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like not me. It's like a very exaggerated version of a child me. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Because I thought it was a woman because of the red lippy. Yeah. So now you're telling me it's you. I'm just like, I thought it was a woman getting... The, that could have been me getting the... <laughs> the, the very bright colors and, and um, very, like, childlike painting. We, we didn't really get into uh, inspiration, but that comes from Henry Taylor and Chase Hall and those guys who are, like, I see as, like, these painting gods that are up there. Um, Henry Taylor paints with acrylic, and he just, like, I love the way he is able to paint something, and then you're able to look at it and go, like, pe people look at work that looks childlike, mm -hmm. and they go, I could do that. And you look at something that Henry Taylor does, and people can say that, but at the same time, it's the story behind it that's more important than what's than what the painting is, you know what I mean? Yeah, well it's the, people underestimate the purposeful choices of an artist mm -hmm. constructing a figure, yeah. be it the, what appears to be a childlike figure, because mm -hmm. we, we all know it looks easy, it's like people are like, I could do that, and then you actually try, it's not that easy mm -hmm. to do. So it is an interesting commentary on the influence of or, or the how that influences you because I don't see your figures as unsophisticated because it mm -hmm. still feels very purposeful in the way you're making choices at this early stage and it, I think it is a foreshadowing about how the work will develop as mm -hmm. you move forward and as those figures either change as you're commenting on different things or, uh, or remain similar because there's tons of, there's a artist, Owen Gordon, who's, I think your figures are similar to his in, in that um, Owen keeps things slender, thin, elongated faces. There's a, um, a, the classical painter Mogliani that when we did uh, Owen's show, we referenced because that, this idea of things being um, graphic or character, caricature-like, is often seen as less sophisticated, and I think it's more sophisticated, and this is just my personal bias, to view work like that, mm -hmm. because I think it lets more people in, as opposed to, which there's a big conversation right now with a lot of curators and art historians around the presence of the over-prevalence of the black figure in contemporary art. People are painting perfect renditions of black people. And then where that's ending up and who's living with that work and what that means to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, your figures allow more people in because it isn't exacting. And the way you use color choices with figure is more tonally, I think, interesting. Because even here with this, with the black father, with the two kids that appear to be quote unquote uh, white presenting, it's just you're playing around both in the gray space or in the skin tone space with what you see, what that really means. And for me, all of your work is a commentary on race as a social construct. That the, when you see somebody, you actually don't know what you're seeing just by the outer shell. You can't assume or decide that you know somebody based on what this is. Because we're all, you were all more complicated than that, right? Um, whether we're aware of it or not. And I think the, prevalence lately of people doing DNA tests is a testament to that. Like people are doing these DNA test samples sending away and then being fascinated when they find out, oh, I'm 3% of this, or, and what that means around their own investigation of lineage. And I find that fascinating. I think I asked you, you've never done that. No, we did. Did you do it? Yeah, yeah. we talked about it. What was, what was it you said it was? Do you remember? What? Yeah, what the, what the lineage says around percentage, because I think this is part of us as asking about your Asian, the Asian yeah, side. Like 2%. Yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, <I talk> <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you're right, because we went, so when we, we, when we didn't go as far back in this discussion as we might have, when we talk about the Irish Canadian and then the Jamaican Canadian, because of your last name, I, and I could see it in the family photos that it was obviously uh, uh, Asian and African influences in your family's uh, uh, history in Jamaica. And those of you who know the Caribbean waves of migration that happened post-slavery, there were indentured servants that were brought from Asia and China South Asian China, so Indian and Chinese migrants that came uh, to work post 
slavery. So this is late, uh, mid to late 19th century, mostly late 19th century. So places like Trinidad with a large um, Asian population has had a larger prevalence. Jamaica had uh, Chinese, uh, Indian, and I think Syrian, and the Syrian merchants came later. So often you see in someone's face, even if it's not in their last name, that there is Chinese uh, uh, heritage there, but they don't necessarily know. And so I wasn't sure if there was a, you know, uh, a grandparent or parent that was more immediate. Yes. But you were like, no, it isn't immediate. So I thought, well, and then when you mentioned the DNA, I thought, so it might be that turn of century. Yeah. Yeah. Does it? Do you know that, Dad? Do you know where the Chinese shows up in that side of your family? Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, we're going to say. My great grandfather. Okay. Three, is that three generations? Yeah. Yeah. Generations. yeah. And, and I think for you, Mom, we had thought it was uh, Irish migration from the uh, family because you, right, was it four or five generations Irish Canadian? Uh, my mom's side from Ireland and my dad is Scottish. Oh, they didn't talk about Scottish. <laughs> see that? See what we learned? Just filled out the picture there. There's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but again, again, you can't, most people you can't tell. You have no idea. And then you'd start to define people based on what you visually see them. And it's like, why are we still doing that? Especially in a city like Toronto. You have no idea when you look at somebody what, yeah. the, what they biologically are. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I want to hear about this. We didn't have it yeah. on. I love that it's Ray and Nephew. Mm -hmm. See yeah. all this chill? Ray and Nephew is my friend. It's how I live in this cold country. <laughs> As we start, I literally went home last night and reorganized things in my little cabinet to make sure the bottle of Ray and Nephew was visible for the concoction that helps one survive. I'm going to step out of the way so you can sort of yeah. see. Ray, Ray and Nephew, um, my, my grandfather wor worked for them. Um, I was confused for a while because I thought he worked for Appleton. So at first I titled this Appleton. Mm -hmm. And then um, I asked my dad more about it and he told me that he worked for Ray and Nephew. Um, but I always thought it would be funny to depict him working on the farm. Um, he didn't, he had an office job, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, Has he seen you putting him on the farm? <laughs> yeah, no, no, he's not around. But, um, yeah, I just thought it would be, I, I did a lot of research of like what these sugarcane farms look like um, and just like what, I didn't really see many photos of like workers on there depicted like this. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to depict a, my grandfather working as a sugarcane farmer um, for Ray and Nephew. But yeah, that's kind of where this came from. Um, and it was like one of the first times I painted with oil. so. It was definitely a challenge to figure that out. It's a lot more, I would say, buttery uh, than acrylic. Um, but yeah, yeah I like it. <laughs> Are we good? Oh. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I read that you shared how your introduction into painting was related to the fact of the pandemic being a big barrier to being yeah. able to take photos. Um, and you previously just shared how, like, this painting was the first time you had the chance to, like, work with oils and how challenging that was. Mm -hmm. Are you able to speak more about some other challenges that you encountered while, like, painting as, you know, like, a medium, as well as maybe, like, it was um, a sneak peek into, like, other mediums you're thinking about yeah. right now that you've had a wonderful and simple uh, Yeah, thank you. Um, I I find that you just need to kind of, and I, I'm no expert on this at all, but I find that you just need to kind of go for it and try something because you never know what you're going to make. Um, with this, for sure, it was, it was a challenge. And like I'm looking at it now and I'm seeing things that I want to change. And just like, you know, it, you, but at some point you kind of have to accept it and be like, this is what it is. Um, but I think there's different ideas of, of thinking in medium. I really want to dive into sculpture. Um, that's one big thing I'd like to do. Uh, and I have no clue how to do that. But it, that's the exciting part about it. And I think from that, you can make new work that is different. And then 
that it's kind of nice not knowing um, a thing about a medium because it's going to be different than other people, you know. And and I think that's why I like the way I paint is because I don't, I don't. I'm not saying I'm different than everyone, but I'm saying that it is different from the things that I've seen um, or the things that I'm influenced by. Maybe a bit similar to that, but yeah, I think it. I think it's just fun to explore. Um, but yeah. I don't that's know what, if that answers the question. That's, yeah. um, that's an artist's life in the speech yeah. pod. You just get to explore things and mm -hmm. make work that you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. The scariest thing was how expensive oil is. That's all. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that was pretty scary. And then you have to you try and use water, and that doesn't work. And mm -hmm. you're just like, OK, what, what do I do? So it's a, it's a learning curve, for sure. It's really soft. Yeah, that's like the. It, you're right, it is interesting how it, you said it's buttery and there's a warmth to what we know is a harsh history. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the cane field is not, right. uh, yeah, it was not a warm and fuzzy place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's almost, as you said, a romantic homage to mm -hmm. a harsh uh, period of history. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting where you chose gray because it felt like you just were comfortable in gray uh, because your, uh, your grandfather isn't white passing. And so it, for me, it's how gray starts to bleed in mm -hmm. to a choice around uh, the lack of clarity around one's story or identity and becomes, a, as a color, just a commentary on that. We referenced um, uh, Lubaina Hamid, a British uh, East African uh, painter, who uses gray in that way around people's uh, hiding something in their identity um, in some of her paintings. We were in um, the UK in, and I'd seen Lubaina's work before, but not that specific body work. So I thought it was interesting knowing how you play with grayscale in photography in the inversion. But then I think, as you said here, you're moving, I've seen a peek at the next body of work that Forbes was working on around um, the idea of someone seeming to be whitewashed or uh, uh, people kind of positioning them in a particular way in society and some of them are uh, kind of iconic uh, uh, public figures. And your use of gray there for me moves away from gray being this personal commentary on what as we've said is this body of work that's commenting on your own life experience into this broader place of, again, you don't know. You look at someone, and the, the grayness is about, it's almost a call to inquire about what's actually there, because it's not clear from looking at someone exactly who they are and what, how their identity is constructed and what the physical representation of them says uh, in your immediate assessment just by looking at them. So I found that cool here, knowing that this was a, a commentary on your grandfather's working for a big yeah. alcohol iconic firm. Could have been Appleton. Could have been Appleton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.